Hey everyone, Norm from Tested here. Hope you've had a wonderful week and weekend. And I'm wrapping up this week with another show and tell from my collectibles collection, as well as a photography demonstration and fun test. Uh, as you're watching this, it should be, I think, Sunday, and I'm actually on paternity leave. All things hopefully going well. I uh, should be out for the next couple of weeks, welcoming a new girl into our family. But as I'm recording this, as we're waiting for that baby, uh, I have another baby I want to show you. So not bearing the lead, uh, this is the Hulkbuster. Of course, it's a one-sixth scale Hulkbuster from Hot Toys comes via Sideshow, and it really is one of those holy grails um, that uh, I have now acquired for my collection. Now, if you recall, this comes from the movie Avengers, Age of Ultron, an incredible fight scene between Iron Man and the Hulk. And uh, after the movie came out, Hot Toys debuted at Comic-Con, their sixth scale, Hulkbuster, and it's not a static statue, not a polystone statue. This is a full articulated, posable figure with some caveats, uh, but they are crazy. They designed it to even fit a Mark 43 Iron Man sixth scale uh, figure and armor within. Like it's multiple figures in one. You actually can think of it almost like a vehicle uh, into itself. And when they announced this, when it went on sale, it actually sold out their first run. Uh, and so this is a re-release. Actually, it's a re-release of both of these, the Hulkbuster and the Diecast Mark 43. And what's uh, different about this new one is that it's the deluxe version, which means it also comes with the jackhammer arm, that scene where he just rapidly punches the Hulk in the face. And that's, I like actually the asymmetry of of the standard arm uh, and having this jackhammer arm, which I have now holding the uh, the Ultron Mark I carcass that came with the Mark 43. I mean, actually, like this is the standard left arm that comes with the Hulkbuster, and it in itself is massive. Like this is a hefty piece of kit. It almost reminds me of like in Deadpool 2 when he has his arm regenerating. That's 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 the kind of thing. That this reminds me of. I'm probably going to use this for maybe a, a diorama in the future. Maybe have a couple of figures holding it up or sitting on it. Don't want to let this go to waste. Uh, but this thing is just, it's, it's a beast and it's massive. The Hulkbuster itself is like 22 pounds and the Diecast Mark 43 is like five pounds. So this is like the weight of a small toddler. Um, and it is beautiful. I mean, it's plastic and it has a metal internal structure for the stability, um, but it looks like it's metal. With these lights set up and the way I have the lights catching and bouncing off of the armor, you can see in some of these like hot spots where the light's catching, it looks like it's made of some type of futuristic alloy. And yes, there is some paint application on, uh, on the armor itself, on the armor pieces to make it look a little weathered, some scratches, some dings, there's even a damaged part right here. But that red, that gold, and most importantly, I think that internal silver part, all the kind of cables and greeblies that they've attached here, it really showcases the beautiful design of this character, which, you know, we saw it in action in the movie, but it happens so quickly, you know, when Veronica pulls all those pieces and Tony pulls them around himself that it isn't until I have this in person and I can kind of look around and I can get all that nuanced detail from, you know, all the kind of uh, arc reactor lights and like the back, the back is just so cool with this array of lights. Um, but actually one of my favorite parts of the design is the boots, the foot here, that leg, that transition from the, the gold here, which has these angular bits of design, to actually the curved calf here, and also the kneecap kind of even protruding from, um, from that kneecap hiding this beautiful arc reactor. These two lights here are actually part of my, this is my favorite parts of this design. Um, a lot of people, when they get this Hulkbuster, they have it in a standard you know, museum pose, is what collectors call it. Arms to the side, straight out. Uh, I'm a big fan of more dynamic pose, and 
posing this thing, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, it doesn't articulate nearly as much as a standard die-cast six-scale figure would. Uh, like for example, the arm, uh, it's not a ball joint in the arm, but it does a full 360 rotation, so you can't really like splay the arm out. Uh, but you do have things like, you know, you do have actual lots of uh, articulation in the wrist, so it doesn't just do a rotation, it can actually tilt up and the sleeve actually retracts as uh, you tilt that up, which is nice. The fingers, of course, articulate. Um, I have the knees bent here, and while the legs don't actually bend outward, and you can only do about a 30 degree tilt forward on the leg, uh, I think it's pretty convincing as uh, kind of giving the illusion of it putting weight on one foot. Um, and it's pretty sturdy. I think they had found a good balance between kind of the, the ratcheting, uh, locking uh, knees and hips and arm joints um, to you know the balance of posability, but also stability. So it's not gonna tip or fall over. And, you know, they designed this thing to fit a whole six scale 12 inch Iron Man on the inside, but I think it's, it's almost like a waste of having that figure. And this one actually does come with, there's a torso if you just want that head inside the armor. So I think the best way to show this off if you have the Mark 43 uh, is to have him emerging from the Hulkbuster, which is what I have him doing right now with uh, the palm out, kind of mimicking the pose uh, is what I'm going for. And of course, showing off the, uh, the Tony Stark head sculpt as well on the Mark 43. I don't think the Mark 43 is kind of essential. You know, the Hulkbuster is plenty great of a figure and the Mark 43 design isn't isn't my favorite um, either. Uh, but this thing is just so gorgeous and I actually haven't had a chance to do some real photography with it. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, I have this table cleared off, have a bunch of lights set up. And what I want to do is not just take photos with my standard DSLR, uh, but also with uh, my phone, my iPhone here. I've been finding increasingly looking at my photo library and and Lightroom that I've been relying on more photos taken with the iPhone in their uh, the Apple Pro Raw format and processing that um, and sharing that on social media than going through the process of exporting a photo from my DSLR um, because the Apple Pro Raw quality is really fantastic. It's really been surprising. It's one of the most underrated features, I think, of the 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Max. Now, of course, if you're an Android phone user, you've been able to take raw photos forever and run it on Lightroom. Of course, not denying that. Uh, but uh, the Apple Pro Raw, which is kind of like their hybrid of uh, a process JPEG, uh, as well as a digital negative DNG file that is about 25 megabytes that you can import in a Lightroom, gives me the flexibility of having a nicely processed JPEG that goes through all of the computational vision algorithms uh, that you get with the built-in phone, or doing the tweaking the minutia uh, adjustments that I get in Lightroom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a series of photos with both the DSLR, this is a Canon 5D Mark IV, uh, and with the iPhone, show you my photography process, uh, walk you through some of that, and then also walk you through my photo editing process in Lightroom and let you be the judge as to whether the phone still falls short of the quality of DSLR or is good enough or even better in some cases than the DSLR. Should be a fun test and let's get to it. Okay, so let's start with the iPhone photography. And what you're getting here is a direct screen recording of me shooting with the iPhone native photo app. I'm just using that because that's my go-to. It 
works nicely with the Apple Pro Raw, and it's of course bundled with all the phones. Uh, we're gonna start off with a portrait orientation shot. And what you just saw me do there is the number one thing I do, which is to stop the exposure down, lower the exposure compensation. That's just tapping on the image to focus, and I'm focusing on the face sculpt right there, and then dragging my finger down to uh, uh, to lower the exposure. And I have my lights pretty bright. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't have a backdrop. And a lot of cases, I don't want to show necessarily the background. It's just the bare walls of the room here. I want that to fade into darkness. And so by lowering the exposure, the figure, which normally would be overexposed because how bright the lights are, uh, that's now nicely exposed. And then the background fades again into that uh, into that black, and I can also adjust that in post-processing. Uh, I'm gonna try a couple different focal lengths. I'm not doing any kind of pinch to zoom. I'm just using either the wide angle, which is the 26 millimeter equivalent, or here the 13 millimeter ultra wide. It's a little bit too skewed, I think, in the ultra wide, but we'll get one just in case. Uh, and uh, that 13 or the 26 millimeter wide angle is very comparable to the 24 millimeter uh, of my DSLR's uh, lens. All right, so we're gonna turn the phone horizontally to do a landscape shot and I'm gonna get up close. And here you can see that because it's a smartphone camera, you know, the sensor size is much smaller on the phone than you would get on a DSLR, uh, which means the sensor has to work a little harder, maybe bump up the ISO to capture the details. Another reason I've bumped up the actual lights I have set up in the room, but also uh, you're gonna get a flatter image, which in this case for figure photography, I actually think that's ideal. You know, if you're opening up wide the aperture, you have that really shallow depth of field, that might look really good. Uh, if you're taking a portrait uh, of someone in real life, you know, just capturing their eyes, but at small scale, you could lose a lot of that foreground or background detail. And I kind of want to be able to get some of that foreground detail here. You're still gonna get a little bit of that foreground blurring of that bokeh, um, but with the smartphone lens, it actually fits very nicely and I get really up close and still get uh, really good detail. So I'm pretty happy with that image. And then checking my focus, getting that catch light on the eyes, the glossy paint right on the eyes of that Hot Toys figure. And yeah, doing kind of an A-B test between different, just slight changes in the angle, filling up the frame. I always like to fill up the frame of the image here so I don't have to crop in later after the fact. And once I have something I'm happy with, once again, you see me dragging down that exposure just to let the background fade into darkness and have the figure looking right. Uh, we're gonna take a step back and get a full body landscape shot as well. I think I want that and using the grid lines here to make sure I have everything lined up. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Making sure my lights are out of frame, lowering that exposure again and snapping that shot. All right, so now we have one portrait shot, two landscape shots, including a full body and a tighter dramatic shot. So we're gonna recreate those photos with the DSLR. Uh, the capture here, the screen capture from the Wi-Fi signal on the DSLR is a little choppy, so we're not gonna go through that entire process. But I did wanna show you this part where you can tell that because of that larger sensor on the DSLR, natively, it's gonna be a much shallower depth of field. And you can see my aperture setting right here is 7.1, uh, which is pretty narrow aperture. It's pretty closed up because I actually don't want that dramatic bokeh for this figure. Once again, it works really well at one to one scale, but at one six or one quarter scale, or even something you know 22 inches tall here, I actually think you lose a lot of the detail if you go for a shallow depth of field. So F7.1 is why I go here, which means I have to bump the ISO a little bit, um, but uh, I'm getting the focus I want, locking into the eyes again, recreating that landscape full body shot, and then we'll take these images into Lightroom and I'll show you how I process them uh, right off of the phone on Lightroom Mobile.
Okay, so now I've imported my three selects, the three different angles into Lightroom Mobile. And I really wanna do my editing on Lightroom Mobile here to show you that the workflow end to end from taking a picture on the phone to doing the post-processing of the raw image uh, and then posting it on social media can all be done uh, locally without having to export and transfer it to the desktop. And Lightroom Mobile is really not only powerful in that it has you know, feature parity with Lightroom on desktop, but also it's fast. The sliders work really well. You're getting immediate response. Um, and I'm seeing it on the phone display that I'm gonna be sharing these photos on. So typically I go through the major settings here, light color and effects, and just with each slider, just, uh, 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 test the the limits of each uh, adjustment, whether it's contrasts or highlights or shadows. I know I'm going to be wanting to boost a little bit of the shadows, maybe decrease some highlights, but it's going to be different between every single image and what type of effect I'm going for. Here, I'm trying to make the Hulkbuster and the armor look like metal so i don't want to take away too many highlights um and i do want to keep some of those details in there so uh, it's going to be one by one um, and the most important thing when i find in adjusting these photos is uh holding tapping the photo and checking before and after what did that last change that i do uh, actually do to the photo i can have a plan in my head of you know the typical steps i do and go through for each photo, but I'm really gonna let the process dictate um, what the final outcome is gonna look like. And here I'm adjusting the dehaze effect, which is something I really love doing. I hear I've dehazed it almost 40 points in Lightroom. Uh, it's an effect that was brought into Photoshop and Lightroom a couple years ago to reduce you know, fog and glare in landscape photography, but I find that's a really quick way to increase contrast and a little bit of saturation. It's kind of easy to overdo, but I really like the effect of it. And it makes the image really pop. And then also uh, when I have the, the glare on the matte surface here on the floor of this image actually decreases that and kind of hones in on the beauty of the figure uh, to a way I like it. So boosting the shadows again, um, decreasing the background brightness, let that background fade into the darkness a little bit. Uh, zooming into the image as well, always, because it is a smartphone photo here. So it's not going to have as many of the sharp details all the way up close as I would normally get with my DSLR. So I compensate for a little bit of that by increasing a little bit of sharpening, maybe adding a little bit of grain, a little bit of noise in there, just to remove some of that muddiness that you might get uh, when you pixel peep into a smartphone picture. Again, always going back and seeing what a balance of settings I wanna do to get the effect I want. So here I'm experimenting with the vignette. Do I want to really isolate you know, with this oval of a shadow around the outside? Maybe not, because it might be too, too, uh, too apparent. So I'm gonna use actually uh, some adjustment um, brushes here and uh, very precisely darken just like the bottom right hand corner. Uh, basically has all these selective edits, the same feature set of color and light and effects, but I can selectively do it with this gradient on these, uh, these bars here. So bottom left, bottom right, I'm gonna go uh, hide those parts of the image in a little bit more darkness. Uh, I can also use radial um, uh, adjustment tools. So create a, a circle and you'll see that I'm going to do that for the, um, for the next image in the arc reactor uh, on the repulsor um, blaster on the, on the hand there, just because I want to bump up the brightness. But, you know, I think I'm pretty happy with this. So because I have the same lighting set between the photos, I can copy the settings of this image, all the tweaks I've done, uh, and then use that as my template uh, to paste that onto the next picture and use that so I'm not starting completely from scratch. And so here I'll paste it onto this landscape photo. And you can see it doesn't provide exactly the same result because the phone has done some of its own white balancing and has done some of its own exposure settings. So uh, this is a place where I can 
start tweaking this photo using at least my lighting settings from the previous photo and then uh, tweaking it to more match up with the other photo. Uh, here, I am going to go back into those selective edits and make tweaks to the gradients. Again, hiding some of that background into darkness um, and then using the radio filters to go right into that hand there to boost up the the repulsor blast because I want that to look much brighter than I have it currently here that make that LED light actually look like a light and not just like a decal. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with how these photos turned out. Uh, these edits are all they're all stored in the Lightroom, so I can always go back and adjust them. And they're not baked into the final file until I export them back out into the camera roll. So it's non-destructive editing here. Um, and I do find that I go back and make tweaks based on you know new things I've learned about Lightroom. It's always fun to go back and see your photo library. And because this is that full res pro raw a data file, uh, having that stored in the cloud and on the phone itself means I'm always going to have uh, the ability to go back and make those edits later. So now we have our three edited photos from our phone, which I think look really nice. I'm really happy with how these three photos came out. And I'm going to go through that same process on Lightroom on desktop for the DSLR photos, and we'll watch that in time lapse. Okay, so here we have it, the side-by-side -side comparison, the iPhone versus the Canon 5D DSLR photos. And they look pretty good, pretty close. I mean, even up close, you can see that, yes, the DSLR gets you more pixels and maybe a little bit better shadow detail, better color reproduction, but the iPhone photos are, they're, they're pretty great and definitely good enough to share on social media. All right, well, there you have it. Thanks for tagging along for this photo shoot of the very impressive Hulkbuster armor. And uh, looking at the photos, I think uh, you might agree with me that the iPhone Pro Raw photos came out very nice and pretty competitive uh, in comparison with the DSLR photos. Uh, hopefully some of the things I talked about while they are designed for my photography setup uh, may still apply and help you with your own photography endeavors. And I'll post some of the high resolution photos uh, on tested.com uh, for you to check out and do a side-by-side comp -side comparison and get a better look than just within the confines of a video window. But once again, thank you so much for watching and indulging me as I photograph this baby while waiting for, well, the other baby to arrive. Thanks again, and I'll see you in a little bit. Bye.